Today, we are unveiling the chilling tales that lurk beneath the holiday cheer. Join us on a spine-tingling journey through the five most bone-chilling and haunting murders that shattered the peace of Christmas. Brace yourself for a shocking dive into dark histories this season. Six-year-old John Benier Ramsey, a child beauty pageant winner, vanished from her Boulder, Colorado, home in the hours between December 25th and December 26th, 1996. Her parents discovered a ransom note demanding $118,000 for her return the following morning. The Ramseys called the police, who found no evidence of forced entry. John Ramsey made a horrific discovery while looking through the house for evidence about how John Benet was kidnapped. His daughter had been murdered and her body had been left in the basement. It was discovered that John Benet had a fractured skull and had died by strangulation. Police first believed that John and Patricia Ramsey had killed their own child and staged the ransom note to cover up the crime. After a very public investigation into the two, they were able to rule out the Ramseys as suspects since they hadn't found enough evidence to support this theory. Then they turned their attention to another possibility. An intruder who broke into the house covertly at night with the intention of kidnapping John Benet but ended up killing her by accident. The intruder then made his escape. The probe has since stagnated because this strategy has also proven to be unsatisfactory. The district attorney and Boulder police released a statement in November 2022 regarding the ongoing homicide investigation, stating that they were going to be consulting with the Colorado Cold Case Review Team in 2023. Since John Bonet's murder, detectives have investigated leads stemming from more than 21,000 tips, letters, and emails, authorities said in a release. We have traveled to 19 states to interview or speak with more than 1,000 individuals. The announcement also stated that Boulder authorities collaborated with Colorado's Department of Public Safety, the FBI, the CBI, and several private laboratories across the country. The amount of DNA evidence available for analysis is extremely small and complex. The sample could, in whole or in part, be consumed by DNA testing, the release continued. In collaboration with the CBI and the FBI, there have been several discussions with private DNA labs about the viability of continued testing of DNA recovered from the crime scene and genetic genealogy analysis. Whenever there is a proven technology that can reliably test forensic samples, consistent with the samples available in this case, additional analysis will be conducted. A year later, and I do not see that this case has been solved. Even though the parents were cleared, do you think they had anything to do with the death of their daughter? If you followed this case, what are your thoughts? The Lawsons were a well-respected family who earned some wealth through tobacco farming in Germantown, North Carolina, about 20 minutes north of Winston-Salem. Charlie Lawson moved to the area to settle with his wife Fanny and their seven children. Arthur, 19, Marie, 17, Carrie, 12, Maybell, 7, James, 4, Raymond, 2, and Mary Lou, 4 months. December 25th, 1929, the Lawson family was enjoying a quiet Christmas. Charlie Lawson, a sharecropper, had treated his wife and seven kids to new clothes and even a family photo shoot. All in all, it appeared to be a wonderful Christmas for them. But then something unexpected happened the details of which historians and scholars cannot figure out, Charlie chose, for reasons that are unclear, to murder his entire family. The Greensboro News and Record claims that he shot two of his younger daughters as they were heading to see their aunt and uncle. After shooting his wife while she was sitting on the front porch, he entered the house and killed his two younger boys and oldest daughter before killing his infant daughter last. After that, he committed suicide by going into the neighboring woods. Did you catch the fact that Lawson killed just six of his seven children? Just before beginning the killings, Charlie sent his oldest son, Arthur, on an errand for mysterious reasons. No motive was ever determined for the killing, nor were his reasons for sparing Arthur. One rumor alleged Charlie was abusing his eldest daughter, Marie, and she was carrying a child. He slaughtered his family as a result of guilt and shame, but this hasn't been confirmed and Marie's autopsy revealed she wasn't pregnant. Why do you think Charlie killed his whole family and why would he buy them all new clothes to do a photo shoot? Was this his way of creating a piece of history for his family? 
And Virginia, it's the news his family did not want to hear, hoping that he would be found alive. But we received this release from Riverside Police saying the body found in the car is indeed 24 year old Gianni Belvedere. Now the questions remain. What led to the deaths of these three promising young people? Waiting in the Macy's parking lot in Mission Valley, California, Gianni Belvedere was on the phone with his cousin. In the wee hours of December 24, 2013, Gianni arrived to get his fiance, Ilona Flint, who was employed there. In order to accommodate last minute customers, Macy's was staying open rather late at the time. According to NBC San Diego, a stranger approached Gianni as he was waiting, shot and killed him, and then stole his car. The man, Carlo Mercado, took Gianni's car to his own home and even filled it up with gas, but he returned to Macy's shortly after because his motorcycle had broken down close by. Once there, Mercado encountered Flint and Gianni's brother Sal, who were searching for him. As soon as they saw Gianni's car, they knew it wasn't him behind the wheel. Mercado proceeded to kill them both. After the killings, Mercado put fake license plates on Gianni's car and parked the vehicle near his home and work in Mira Mesa. Gianni's body was left in the trunk of the car for three weeks. At one point, he tried to sell the stolen vehicle. Three weeks later, he drove the car to Riverside, California and abandoned it in the parking lot of a shopping center located more than 100 miles away from San Diego. On January 17, 2014, police found Gianni's badly decomposed body stuffed into the trunk of his own car in that lot in Riverside. For five months, there was no break in the baffling triple homicide case. On June 20, 2014, Mercado was arrested as the suspect in the slayings. On June 28, 2014, Mercado was charged with three counts of murder. Mercado, then 31, pleaded guilty and was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Do you think this was road rage? Was this personal? Maybe even some weird love triangle? Let me know in the comments your opinion. Following Christmas Eve dinner, Joseph Papa Joe Ortega, his 53-year-old wife, and their kids were enjoying a late night game of Texas Hold'em in their Covina Homes dining room. Their grandchildren lounged around the backyard swimming pool and played computer games. Michael, the 17 year old grandson of the Ortegas, was tapping away at a computer on the second floor of the house. There was a knock on the front door and the squeal of an eight year old girl happily cried, Santa Claus, Santa Claus. A man disguised as Santa Claus shot the girl in the face a few seconds later, injuring two of her uncles as well. The ex-wife of the gunman and the three daughters of the Ortegas sought refuge beneath the dining table. However, it was useless. The Ortegas, four of their children, two daughters-in-law, and the teenager at the computer would all die at the hands of Bruce Jeffrey Pardo. The survivors among the 25 to 30 people celebrating Christmas Eve with the Ortegas have not spoken publicly. However, several of the relatives' accounts were corroborated by law enforcement authorities with knowledge of the investigation painting the most accurate picture of what occurred inside the home. The family members described a horrifying situation in which a gunman was intent on killing people and relatives fought to survive as well as trying to save their loved ones in the chaos. When Pardo arrived at the party, many of the adults were at the front of the house because people were beginning to leave, making them especially vulnerable in the attack, sources say. Pardo, whose murderous rampage was apparently triggered by his divorce from the Ortega's daughter Sylvia, had planned to escape and had bought a plane ticket to Illinois. But he was badly burned in the explosion and ensuing fire, with second and third degree burns on his arms. He drove 40 miles to his brother's home in Silmar, where he committed suicide. Los Angeles County Coroner's Lieutenant Fred Corral said there was an exit wound at the top of Pardo's head, suggesting he put the gun in his mouth before pulling the trigger. It is sickening hearing about these family killers, or annihilators as they are also called. Did a divorce really drive him to kill so many people? What do you think about this heartbreaking case? A South African-born couple have been found guilty of torturing and murdering a 15-year-old boy in a trial bedeviled by witchcraft, possession and exorcism. Christy Bamu was killed by his sister and her partner in their attempts, they said, to protect another child from evil spirits. Sentencing the pair to life imprisonment, the judge at the Old Bailey said the case had been so harrowing the jury would be exempted from any further service for the rest of their lives.
According to the BBC, 15-year-old Christy Bamou and his four siblings traveled from Paris to London during the 2010 Christmas season to stay at the house of their oldest sister, Magali. It appeared to be a very nice Christmas time get-together with the family. However, things quickly spiraled out of hand and Christy passed away on Christmas Day. But this was merely the sad conclusion of his lengthy ordeal. The events that preceded his death were nothing short of horrific. Magali Bamou, 29, moved in with Eric Bakubi, her boyfriend, and they shared an apartment. Things appeared to be going well at first, but Eric accused Magali's siblings of practicing kindoki, a sort of witchcraft said to be performed by evildoers in their home country of the Democratic Republic of the Congo after an unidentified incident. At first, he blamed all of Magali's siblings, but he soon turned his attention to Christy in particular. This started a nightmare that lasted for several days, during which Christy was tortured with pliers, knives, and, grotesquely, a hammer and chisel. Bikubi forced other children into joining him in the assaults while beating the siblings of his fiancée. Bikubi had also encouraged Christy and his sisters, who were 20 and 11 years old, to try their luck at flying by jumping out of the window. By making fake admissions, the sisters were able to avoid more beatings. But after Christy soiled himself, the campaign of abuse resumed. While Eric claimed to be attempting to exorcise Christy, his sister Magali did nothing. In the end, Eric drowned Christy in the bathtub. Following the incident, Eric stated that he thought Christy was a witch due to his own brain damage. What was perhaps more terrifying about Magali's passivity was her denial of any belief in witchcraft. At the trial, Sister Kelly, who was 21 years old, testified before the court, saying, It was as if they were obsessed by witchcraft. They decided we had come there to kill them. She added, Christy asked for forgiveness. He asked again and again. Magali did absolutely nothing. She didn't give a damn. She said we deserved it. Bakubi and Magali Bamu were both convicted of torturing and killing Christy. Additionally, Bamu was found guilty of two counts of assault, to which her boyfriend had already entered a guilty plea. While Bamu was imprisoned for 25 years, Bakubi was sentenced to at least 30 years in prison. 